like I said, I like to immerse myself in all the books individually. Then what I do is I just get them all as physical objects and just spread them around on the floor at home. And Fiona Benson's book, Vertigo and Ghost, was spread out on the floor with the other books. And it happened to be at the top of the spreading out. And my youngest grandchild, Noah, came to see us. He was three. And he pushed Fiona's book even further up to the top. And he thought that we were making a kind of, I don't know, a totem or a, an image or a mannequin because Fiona's book has got a head on the cover. And he liked the fact that there was the head at the top. But then he got bored with that and... He took the book and he moved it right down to the middle, about here, in the body of the books that we'd set out. And I thought, he's a clever lad, that Noah. He's his granddad's grandson. Because <laughs> it struck me that that's what this book does. It takes the head, it takes the brain, it takes the mind, and it places it in the body. And it makes the two of them indiffusible. You can't separate them. The head, the body, the mind, the brain, the body, all coming back to the body, to oppression, to violence, to relationships, to things that are worse than relationships, that are kind of fights and, and, and violence, and that's what this book does. Um, so I thanked Noah very much for moving this down to the bottom, but by then he got fed up and we had to play Robot Pat and his Robot Cat, which I've got to tell you, isn't as good as this book by a long chalk. <laughs> Fiona Benson. That's a long walk. <laughs> um, thank you. It's such an honour to be here um, with my poetry family, with my poetry family. Um, and I'm so thrilled and honoured to be here. Ace of Bass. That was the summer hormones poured into me like an incredible chemical cocktail into a tall iced glass. My teenage heart, a glossy maraschino cherry bobbing on top as that rainbow shimmered through me, lighting me up like a fish, and I was drunk, obsessed, desperate to be touched, colour streaming from my iridescent body as the wide summer night threw open its doors and called us into the evening to sit in its love seat and gossip about boys, though we'd have fucked anyone back then. Each other had we dared, right there on the tennis courts, all us unparented girls released from the boarding house to practice our backhand, desire between us like a shared addiction in its crooked spoon, desire and the holding back the terrible restraint as we listened to the top 40 or our three CDs till the batteries ran down, till the asphalt's grit had pressed its intricate red pattern on our thighs. And we talked about who'd done what with whom and how it felt, all of us quickening. And sex wasn't here yet, but it was coming and we were running towards it, its gorgeous euphoric mist, pressing into our own starved bodies at night for relief, like the after calm might last, like there was a deep well of love on the other side. I'm going to read a few little bits um, from the Zeus sequence in this book. Sometimes um, Zeus speaks. If he's speaking, I'm going to hold my arms out to indicate that he's taking up space. <laughs> Zeus. 
Zeus. Days I talked with Zeus, I ate only ice, felt the blood trouble and burn under my skin, found blisters on the soft parts of my body, bulletproof glass and a speakerphone between us, and still I wasn't safe. Thunder moved in my brain, tissue crease, hemorrhage. I kept the dictaphone running. It recorded nothing but my own voice, vulcanized and screaming, you won't get away with this. Archives, Zeus on parole. No fun. This ankle band tases me every time I brush the bounds, and yet it is, shall we say, erotic. Its sudden curse, its thrill. Archives. Zeus given light sentence temporary jail, the judge delivers that he is an exemplary member of the swimming squad. Look at his muscular shoulders, the way he forges through water. As for the girl, personal. Rape is rarely what you think. Sometimes you are outside yourself, looking down, thinking slut, as you let him do what he wants on your own familiar sheets to stop the yelling and the backhand to the face and the zeroing in of the fist. Surveillance, track and field. Zeus with his hair in a golden tail down at the running track coaching girls. Spikes on asphalt. I will make you as fast as shock lightning, my beauties, if you yield, if you groom well. Transformation Daphne. who roots, flares into leaf, becomes tree. But in the change before the change, Zeus's son courses her like a hound, and Daphne is a hare trying to leap free. That day at the races, a whippet lost its head in the hold, its cries leaking out of the dark trap like poisoned milk, then clank, and all the gates lifted, and the dogs streaked out, hurtling after a dummy on casters, which rattled over the sleepers of a long, greased rail. The pack was an unreadable blur. Once it was over, handlers hooked their legs over the barrier and came for their dogs, clipping on each leash. Zeus behind the scenes, his electric shock collar, his snippets of meat. Out beyond the pale, there's no straight course just waterlogged fields and Daphne's hectic blurts of speed. She's at the edge of her wits, retching with fear, and he is everywhere, stumbling her up, ahead of her, above, his stink, his spit. He hollers and barks in the rough of his throat, cuffs out her legs from under her, tears at her flanks with his teeth, but still delays. And still she doubles back and jinks and faints 
and flees. By nightfall, she is ragged in her hind end, blood ebbed and frayed and wanting to be gone into the gentleness. So there's this bright light, this dazzle in her eyes that won't let her sleep. She cries for her daddy, like any other girl who's run beyond her strength, whose heart has failed. When a hare dies, it screams like a mortal child. Disconcerted, Apollo looks up from the field. There's Zeus in the dark, holding the lamp. That day at the races, a whippet lost its head in the hold, its cries leaking out of the dark trap like poisoned milk, then clank, and all the gates lifted and the dogs streaked out, hurtling after a dummy on casters, which rattled over the sleepers of a long, greased rail. The pack was an unreadable blur. Once it was over, handlers hooked their legs over the barrier and came for their dogs, clipping on each leash. Zeus behind the scenes, his electric shock collar, his snippets of meat. Out beyond the pale, there's no straight course just waterlogged fields and Daphne's hectic blurts of speed. She's at the edge of her wits, retching with fear, and he is everywhere, stumbling her up, ahead of her, above, his stink, his spit. He hollers and barks in the rough of his throat, cuffs out her legs from under her, tears at her flanks with his teeth, but still delays. And still she doubles back and jinks and faints and flees. By nightfall, she is ragged in her hind end, blood ebbed and frayed and wanting to be gone into the gentleness. So there's this bright light, this dazzle in her eyes that won't let her sleep. She cries for her daddy, like any other girl who's run beyond her strength, whose heart has failed. When a hare dies, it screams like a mortal child. Disconcerted, Apollo looks up from the field. There's Zeus in the dark, holding the lamp, keeping it steady for the rape and the kill. I'm going to finish with a poem um, about a fighter jet. You're a fighter typhoon. My daughters are playing outside with plastic hoops. The elder is trying to hula over and over. It falls off her hips, but she keeps trying, and the younger is watching and giggling and they're happy in the bright afternoon. I'm indoors at the hob with the door open so I can see them because the elder might trip and the younger is still a baby and liable to eat dirt. When out of clear skies, a jet comes in low over the village. At the first muted roar, the elder runs in, squealing, then stops in the kitchen, her eyes adjusting to the dimness, looking foolish and unsure. I drop the spoon and bag of peas and leave her frightened and tittering, 
wiping my hands on my jeans, trying to walk and not run because I don't want to scare the baby who still sat on the patio alone looking for her sister, bewildered, trying to figure why she's gone. All this in the odd, dead pause of the lag. Then sound catches up with the plane, and now its grey bellies right over our house with a metallic grinding scream like the skies being chainsawed open. And the baby's face drops to a square of pure fear. She tips forward and flattens her body on the ground and presses her face into the concrete slab. I scoop her up. And she presses in, shuddering, screaming her strange, halt, pain cry. And it's all right now, I tell her again and again. But it's never all right now. Christ, have mercy. My daughter in my arms can't steady me. Always some woman is running to catch up her children. We dig them out of the rubble in parts like plaster dolls. Mary, Mother of God, have mercy. Mercy on us all. <laughs>